Well, uh, we're up to chapter 10 in Criminal Justice Today, our text, and today we're going to be starting the three chapters that constitute the unit on the correctional system of the criminal justice system. Uh, this is often an afterthought uh, when people think about crime and justice, uh, but in fact it occupies a tremendous amount of resources and a tremendous amount of space in our study of crime, criminality, um, and criminal justice procedure. So let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, again, we start off with our learning objectives. These uh, are just some very broad topics, and usually there's about eight of them, um, that we hope uh, that people listen to the lecture and people read this chapter, kind of get an idea of uh, what's going on, you know, what's well, what's the overarching, over, uh, over the larger idea of the chapter, simply. Again, you don't have to know these specifically, although they'll often kind of repeat themselves in our reviews. Okay, some questions to ask before um, we really delve into the chapter. And um, these are just some questions, and I like to start some of the later questions after you're used to my lectures with these. And the first one I, I'd like to posit to you is, does probation really qualify as punishment or as rehabilitation? So if we, we looked last uh, lecture at the four purposes of sentencing, two of which were to punish retribution, and one of which was to uh, uh, rehabilitate. Where does probation fall in there? Because probation is going to be our most common uh, result of a trial where someone is found guilty, if there is a trial. Uh, the second question is, what crimes deserve probation and which crimes deserve incarceration? Uh, is there some sort of line we can say? Is it, was someone physically harmed? Is it the amount of damage? Is it the age of the offender? Is it the likelihood of rehabilitation? You know, there's a lot of questions that go into that. How do we make that distinction? And I think importantly, hidden in that question is, who makes that decision? Uh, the third question um, does probation widen the net? Um, we're going to talk about widening the net in, in all of these chapters, um, but suffice it to say it's the concept that um, sometimes by changing a system you bring more people into it. So by having probation as opposed to incarceration, uh, you can afford to have more people brought into the criminal justice system, and is that wise? The last question, of course, is why did we abolish parole in this country, which we have been steadily doing, um, done in the federal system for years, but uh, in state-by-state state, parole has gradually been disappearing. All good questions, I think, that could help you really understand uh, better uh, much of the background and much of the application of the correctional system. Okay, so we're going to start off talking about probation. Now, I'm as guilty as everybody else as using the term probation and parole as essentially interchangeable. But I'd like to start off here with making a clear distinction. Probation means you've never gone to prison in the first place. You've had a trial or you've entered a plea. You have, um, as a result of that, um, been found guilty or accepted your guilt. And now the judge is going to, as opposed to putting you in prison, he's going to let you out. He's going to put you on probation. Um, parole is different. Parole, people actually have gone to prison, sometimes jail, but most often prison, and they do some, maybe most, maybe half, maybe a percentage of their uh, time, and then they're going to be released and finish their sentence on the outside. The two terms taken together probation and parole, which again are not interchangeable terms even though I'm as guilty as everybody else in using as such, taken together are considered as community corrections because the offender is going to be present in the community more so than of course if he's in a jail or prison. Okay, why probation? Why community corrections? Why do we do this? Well, here's three reasons. And to remind you yet again, just because someone gives three reasons doesn't mean there isn't five or ten. Um, but here are three good reasons to start with. One, reintegration. Two, diversion. And three, cost. So by reintegration, 
one of the things about probation and parole, community corrections together, means that the offender, particularly if he's in sort of some sort of transitional status, like he's in a halfway house and he's working towards full release, he's being prepared to return to the community. Um, he's being really given additional tools, hopefully, so he's not going to wind up back inside the criminal justice system. The second, um, and this is probably easier to think about when you think about youths, um, or if, if you like uh, my cousin Vinny's youths, um, is diversion. Um, so if you take someone who's very young, very often we think, well, we, he's really not going to gain anything by prison. In fact, it might be a very negative thing. So we'd like to still punish him, make him aware of what he did wrong, but we want to get him outside of the system. We're also sometimes frightened what's going to happen to young offenders, 13, 14 years old, inside any sort of structured environment, a prison or a jail. So we'd like to divert them away. Um, the third real reason that we utilize community corrections is cost. Um, jail is expensive. Prison is more expensive than jail. Um, Community-based corrections, probation and parole, is cheap. Now, this is an economic reason to do something. It's not what we would call a criminological reason. But nonetheless, we, we are economic creatures. We do function, at least in part, based upon the cost of things. So certainly it is a fair and accurate statement to say that one of the reasons we have probation and parole in community corrections is that it is cheaper than sending someone to prison or jail, but of course still demonstrates our disapproval of their action. Okay, um, it's also true that someone in the community corrections or probation parole world has fewer rights than the regular citizen. In, in fact, he has agreed to this, or she has agreed to this, and I'm going to use the male pronoun here. Um, you have agreed to surrender some of your rights in return for not being sent to prison. And we're going to require you to meet certain conditions, and those conditions are going to be supervised overall by a probation officer. The court will create them, the court will impose them, and sometimes they're cookie cutter, sometimes they're just the standard ones, get a job, uh, don't commit another crime, maintain a residence, report to your officer. We'll look at those. But uh, sometimes we can put special ones in there, like, uh, okay, you're a veteran and you, you committed some offense, but we don't want to incarcerate you because we feel that your crime is somehow related to PTSD, which is linked to your service. Therefore, we're going to require you to um, seek uh, mental counseling. Now, the theory, of course, is that community corrections is both more humane and more economical. So you are between the world of the full citizen with all rights, all protections, and the inmate who has very few rights. He has still some basic human rights, but we've decided to take away m many of his rights. One could argue, and this is going to be a somewhat contentious lecture, a micro lecture, is that probation and parole has been used, along with corrections, as a new form of slavery or exploitation in our country. So probation has some very interesting side effects, uh, one of which would be the loss of the right to vote, uh, one of which would be the concentration of people on probation and parole outside the countryside and into particular areas one of which would be the greater control over people who commit this. So we'll look at all of those in Micro Lecture 10.1, somewhat a contentious lecture, but I think it's worth exploring. Okay, what are our numbers? What happens? Well, if you look at where people wind up, um, you'll notice that probation, if you look at this chart, and it's just correctional control, you'll notice that probation is by far the most common thing that happens. There's also a significant number of people on parole. Uh, there's a fair number of people in local jails and a fair number of people in state prisons, and then we have some of the smaller ones. Uh, that immigration slides on that slide would be bigger today. Uh, the military would be a little bit smaller. Uh, involuntary commitments that fluctuates, federal prisons, again, fluctuation. So 
Numbers are uh, a little difficult to arrive at, but it is, as I said, the most common sentence for someone who goes through the criminal justice system and winds up either being found guilty or pleading guilty. So I said I'd talk about some of the common conditions of probation. The first one is obviously you're going to report to your probation officer. Someone has to be supervising that you're behaving yourself on the outside. Uh, a second one, and this is almost always, I don't think I've ever seen it not uh, instituted, is you are going to pay court costs and if possible you're going to pay restitution. So if you get convicted of even a traffic ticket in Wake County, um, you're going to be assessed court costs. And you know, court costs, again, can go to a lot of things. Um, certainly part of court cost is used to pay probation, so it becomes a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy or application, rather not prophecy. If necessary, uh, because alcohol and drug use often form part of the problem we're dealing with, you are required to go and get alcohol or drug treatment. Now, that's not paid for by the state usually, uh, though sometimes there's programs that assist you. Um, this is something that you're going to have to go out and seek, private treatment. Um, again, this is not going to be applied if you're a burglar, but it is going to be applied if we catch you selling dope or using dope and committing some crime or being addicted to something like meth or crack. Uh, one of the fourth ones, uh, very common, and this really is something that harkens back all the way to the beginning of corrections, which we'll talk about more when we start talking about prisons, is you're going to have to have a job. Um, we feel in our society that employment makes you better. Um, and again, we'll talk about that more when we get to corrections, uh, the, the formal corrections of prisons. Obviously, we don't want you to commit any new crimes. Um, we also don't want you to associate with criminals, so you're going to have to cut ties with persons or people who um, are still in the lifestyle that you're coming out of. Uh, very often we require a curfew. Now those are just the kind of general conditions. There can be very specific conditions related to the crime you committed. Um, <clears throat> there are specialized forms of probation. So one is um, suspended sentence, where the offender is sentenced after being convicted of a crime but is not required to begin serving the sentence. We can put people in day reporting centers. That's exactly what it sounds like. We have shock incarceration, which is you serve usually periods of time, up to 90 days in a prison and then a release, so it's really more a parole type situation. And then we have intermittent incarceration, where you can serve blocks of times, often weekends, uh, in prisons or jails. So we have a number of different tools that different jurisdictions, different states will use. So who gets probation? Um, well, I think it's fair really to look at who's not going to get it. First of all, if you have multiple offenses, you know, it's one thing if you have uh, one charge of simple assault. You were in a bar, you got drunk, you hit someone. You didn't hurt him severely. He, he wasn't cut. He didn't lose an eye or a limb. So it's really an assault charge. Uh, even if it's a serious enough assault charge, say an assault inflicting serious injury, that it's a felony, um, it's, you're still going to get probation. But if you have 10 or 20 convictions, or, and I've seen people with 10 convictions for assault uh, in North Carolina, uh, the odds of you getting probation drop because we just feel that whatever we've done in the past, which is usually probation, hasn't worked. You also typically will be denied probation if you commit the crime while you're already on probation. Um, we also will look into your past crimes, and this, of course, relates to your multiple offenses. Uh, addicted to narcotics, um, and this is somewhat of a judgment. Uh, we feel that uh, people with addiction issues might be better handled depending upon what they're addicted to in prison or jails. And narcotics is a very broad term. Um, it usually will not include alcohol unless it's somehow related to the crime. So if you have a habitual drunk driver, yes, uh, the addiction to alcohol, being an alcoholic, would, mean, would be a good reason why you wouldn't get probation. Uh, did you seriously injure someone? Once you've gone past the 
uh, lowest level of harm or the lower levels of harm. And you go to something like uh, North Carolina, for example, has an offense called the maiming of the eye, ear, nose, or, or tongue. If you beat someone and put out their eye, or if you beat them so severely they were, became deaf in one ear, um, that would be serious enough that you probably would not get probation. Uh, did you use a weapon in committing a crime? Many jurisdictions say once you're using a weapon, probation really goes out the window. Now, in a lot of states, North Carolina is a good example of this, uh, use of a weapon in certain crimes will actually add to your sentence. Under that structured sentencing we looked at last lecture, um, we add 60 months to your sentencing if you have con been convicted of a crime with a gun in certain senses like bank robbery. Okay, um, now the conditions of probation, this is one of the areas where we've, we, we've let the judge keep a lot of his power. And very often, as I said before, the, the personal philosophy of the judge is important. So they can focus on things like, well, if I put this guy in jail, his family's destitute. Or they could focus on things like, I got to put this guy in jail because he needs to be punished. Or they could focus on things like, he's got to work to support people or working is going to be more effective at fixing him, or he's young. So the, the personal philosophy, how the judge approaches it, is really important. Because this is one of the areas where we still have let the judges keep a lot of their discretion on how they're going to behave. You can kind of see this as a contract between the state, using their agent as the judge, and the person convicted. Here's the conditions that we're going to let you out. Here's how you have to behave. If you don't behave, you're going to go to jail, or if it's serious enough, you're going to go to prison. So you can look at it as a, a, as a contractual relationship. It's really not civil law. It's criminal law here. So we have, um, we have standard conditions, which I've already talked about quite a bit. These are imposed upon almost all probationers, like I said. Very, very common to see someone get uh, conditions of uh, you have to have a job, you have to maintain a residence, um, no association with known criminals. We also can have punitive conditions. Sometimes we feel that you have to be punished for some reason. So kind of an example here would be if someone was a computer hacker, um, you'd have a condition, yes, you can't go out and commit future crimes, but we would have a punitive condition that says, okay, you can't operate um, a computer um, on the internet. So we want to punish you to emphasize, and of course to prevent your ability to commit future crimes. Um, often, depending upon the type of crime, we also start to look at treatment. Um, in the 30 odd years that I've been an attorney, and involved in the criminal justice system, I have to say that the most serious drug that has impacted um, our criminal justice system is alcohol. Um, it's certainly not marijuana. Uh, I can't tell you, um, you know, of the police officers I know and the district attorneys I've met, I don't think any of them, if they're honest, would say, oh yes, marijuana is a worse scourge than alcohol. Um, and I'm being a little hypocritical here because I do drink alcohol, but alcohol, I have seen lots of cases where individuals got drunk and got mean. Uh, they beat up their spouses, they beat their children, um, they drove drunk, they harmed innocent people. I have rarely, if ever, seen a case where someone that used um, marijuana uh, did such a thing. Usually they're sitting on their couch watching Adult Swim, uh, not even bothering to look for the remote and wondering where the next bag of Cheetos is. It's not a healthy drug. I'm not, I'm not saying that marijuana is uh, a great substitute, but it is, alcohol in particular, is a very dangerous drug for some people. And it, it is a common condition of your probation if alcohol was involved in your crime that you receive counseling and or treatment for it. The other thing that is sometimes necessary, and we'll talk about this more in, in later units, is 
mental health counseling beyond external drug or alcohol abuse. So you can have individuals who have come into the criminal justice system because they have mental health issues. It could be issues of depression, it could be issues of aggression or manic behavior, um, and some of these issues at least can be addressed better either with pharmaceutics or counseling. Very often you'll see a judge say, okay, you were convicted of, say, drunk driving. Um, a very common condition in North Carolina uh, is that you have to, first of all, undergo a drug and alcohol assessment. Um, one of the things when I used to represent drunk drivers is I would send them before trial to go and get a drug and alcohol assessment at some place like Holly Hills because it was going to be ordered as a condition of um, parole, probation anyway, uh, so they're going to have to do it. And if you do it before, it's actually a mitigating factor in sentencing. So it's extremely common in those multitude of cases where we're talking about um, drunk driving or intoxicated behavior. Um, there is a political impact of probation. We'll talk about this. I, the previous lecture was really about imposing slavery and the, the, the issues of it. Um, but micro lecture 10.2 is going to focus on the political impact of probation. Um, and it's really going to look at what civil rights are lost, who's losing them, um, and how different states treat people convicted of crimes. Moving on, let's talk about one of the unsung heroes of our criminal justice system. Um, certainly, uh, you've seen lots of movies and TV shows about uh, prosecuting attorneys and defense attorneys and police officers investigating crime, um, but you don't tend to see any movies about probation officers. Now, sometimes you see movies about criminals like Shawshank Redemption in prison, but you almost never see the probation officer, and um, he is worthy of being examined. He has two primary duties here. One, he is often in different jurisdictions in charge of conducting pre-sentencing investigations. So he's going to go out and say, okay, Your Honor, if you're going to release this guy, here's his living conditions, here's his job, here's his family. Um, so he, he does investigations, and then after the judge imposes the conditions of probation, he's also the guy that's going to supervise him. He's going to monitor them. Now, in smaller agencies, I'm, I'm going to just guess, if you're up in uh, Montana or Wyoming where there's more cows than people, I'm going to guess that the probation officer does both of those. But in your larger cities, Los Angeles, uh, New York, uh, Miami, Chicago, New Orleans, um, those duties are going to be split. Usually you're going to have the investigators and the supervisors. There is also, particularly for the supervising, there's also a bit of a conflict here. He's got this relationship. The probation officer has this relationship with the offender, the person on probation. And he Part of his job is to assist him in completing his probation. But conflicting with that job is protecting the community. So he's got to wear two hats. He's, he, he can't be a true friend or a lie of the person on probation. But, of course, if he's an enemy, if he, if he acts hostily, he, he's going to have a lower success rate. But he also has to protect us, the community, from people that we are putting on probation or parole from future offense. Now some of this is played out with the problem of caseload. So you could fairly ask um, what is the proper level? How many people should a probation officer monitor? Well part of that really depends and there are, I, I cited this for nonviolent offenders, but uh, for all offenders. But the American Probation and Parole Association has set some standards. So if you've got nonviolent offenders, you've got people that did something really minor, probably not requiring a lot of supervision, um, you can get away with a probation officer having 200 of those. 
If, however, we go a step up, you've got someone who committed a crime of violence, but it's not a severe danger. He can probably, or she can probably, monitor 50 of those. On the other hand, at the high end of the scale, if someone really needs intensive supervision, that probation officer should have no more than 20 of those that he watches. So if we took a typical month, which has 20 days, work days in it, what you're, sensing, what you're saying is for intensive probation, where you've got to keep an eye on dangerous offenders, you're going to have eight hours a month, or one day out of that month, to really keep an eye on someone who's done something dangerous. Check their references. Check they're still living where they are. Go out and interview their spouses. Go out and talk to their bosses. If you've, and, and 20 is probably pressing it. 20 is probably high. Unfortunately, like all organizations in the, in the government, we may want to just have 20 offenders, but that's not how things work out. Uh, the actual caseloads vary dramatically. Um, in some states, for people that you would say were severe, um, it can be very high. Now, in North Carolina, and there was a citation to the report, we're running about 60. Uh, per probation officer, which is not great, but it's not terrible. Again, if we use our kind of crude analogy of you have 20 work days in a month, um, it's going to mean that in a given day, you can spend two or three hours once a month watching people, checking up on them. It does limit how intensive you can be, but it's not terrible. Now, some states are much, much worse. Some are much better. Some states give people 200 to watch. Now, again, if, if, if it's 20 and you have one day, if it's 200, that means you have 10 people a day you're going to watch, which is an eight-hour day, which means you're going to have about 40 minutes to keep an eye on someone, which realistically means all you can do is make phone calls. Hey, is John still working at the garage doing repairs on transmissions? Yes, he is. No, he isn't. Thanks. Click. Hey, is, uh, is Jane still at uh, 102 uh, Main Street? Yes, no. So the more you give probation officers to do, of course, the less time they have to monitor people, which could have really bad results. Okay, revocation or completion. There's two options that we go through here um, for someone on probation. Obviously, they can complete their probation. They get a six-month probation, and they're supposed to maintain a job and, and uh, you know, go to counseling and report to their, um, maybe it's a day reporting center, maybe they report to their probation officer, maybe they take urine tests. They do all those things. They go through six months. They're done. We let them go. Um, unfortunately, some people can't do that, um, and there is a problem. So let's suppose, uh, you know, let's, let's take this recent COVID-19 outbreak as an example of how discretion is called for here. 40 million people lost their jobs. And I'm going to guarantee you that people on probation or parole that got a job, because the, the, the economy was pretty strong and there, were a, um, there was a low unemployment rate. So people on probation could get jobs. Well, I'm going to assure you that when they started getting rid of people, some of the first people they got rid of were ones that they had hired because they didn't have an alternative. They didn't have people that weren't on probation. So during the last couple months when the unemployment rate has soared, you're going to have millions of people that are on probation that one of their conditions of probation was get and keep a job that don't have jobs. Okay, well now you're going to have to make a decision. Do you revoke someone's probation when you have when they lose a job if it's condition of their probation and they can't get one? So you're going to have to decide: is this a serious act? You know, obviously, if someone stabs someone, shoots someone, uh, rapes someone, burns down a church, that's serious enough. You're going to revoke revoke probation, or you're going to at least file for revocation. But sometimes you have technical violations, really minor. Um, they moved and didn't file their change of address. They, um, they missed one out of 20 appointments um, of a drug treatment. So 
Obviously, probation officers have a lot of discretion for very minor or technical violations. They almost have no real discretion for a serious act. Certainly, they wouldn't overlook that, a murder or rape, something like that. But in between, it really calls for discretion. And this is the, the, the issue rearing its head again. How much discretion do you give people? Do you say, well, they don't get a job, they don't meet the conditions, back to jail? Or do you say, well, you know, given the circumstances of pandemic and massive unemployment, we really can't expect this and we'll let the probation officers make the decision. Assuming that there is going to be a revocation, what happens? Well, it's not like a complete formal trial or retrial. It's also not automatic couple things have to happen. And this is really a three-state or stage process. The first state is you're going to have a preliminary hearing. At this point, a judge, and the level of the judge kind of depends on the offense, is going to hear evidence. Is there probable cause, which is a standard for arrest as well, to revoke probation? So it's kind of, all right, is there really a problem here or is this just nonsense? The second one, and sometimes these are combined, is a revocation hearing. Now this is going to be in front of a judge. The probation agency, usually through the corrections officer, probation officer, is going to present evidence that supports that there was a violation. Now, People that are having their probation revoked have the right to testify, to present witnesses and evidence. It's not the same level of evidence and standard that you're going to see in a regular court. Um, if, now there, you, you can have issues uh, where if there's going to be a revocation, there's going to be an attorney present for them, but again, often this is waived, often this is difficult. But alleged probation violators are entitled to an attorney during the revocation processing. And the judge must decide if it was established there was a violation that was uh, sufficient to revoke. Now, it is not the same standard that you see in a criminal trial where it's, was there proof beyond a reasonable doubt that the individual committed the crime? In a revocation, there is no presumption of innocence. The standard is merely, by a preponderance of the evidence, was it established that the individual on probation violated his probation? If there is, that's it. The judge can find that there was, and they can send him to jail or prison. Okay, does it work? Well, um, it depends how you want to measure this. Do we want to measure it based upon the number of individuals on probation that are rearrested? Or do we want to measure it on the number of probationers that complete their probation uh, and never wind up back in the system? Do we want to say we want 5% rehabilitation or 10% or 20? What number are we looking for? Effective supervisory probation strategies include behavioral monitoring and behavioral changes. Um, there is a quote attributed to Einstein, but it's really not his, that says insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. Um, if you've got someone who is in an unhealthy pattern of behavior, that this pattern is manifesting in criminal activity, effective supervisory probation would be to change this pattern of behavior. And that can be very difficult. Uh, one of the things we do know is the smaller the caseload, the fewer there is, the more that the probation officers can be involved, can regulate, can ensure that, okay, there's been a slight deviation, but we can push it back onto the tracks, the lower the rates of recidivism. Now, recidivism, uh, just quickly to define it, means you have been rearrested for another crime. So what are your big risk factors for recidivism? Let's take it from the bottom up. Um, one is unemployment and substance abuse. If you don't have a job and you need to eat, people will steal. If you don't want to get a job, people will steal. And not just steal, they'll do other things. 
There's also issues of substance abuse. Um, the higher level of substance abuse you see, both alcohol and other drugs, more likely recidivism. Is there social support for crime? That can mean something like, are there people or groups around you that assist, manifest, or enable the commission of your crime? So to, to use a crude example, if you had someone arrested for prostitution and he or she returned back to the community and uh, they got back in contact with their pimp, this would be support for the crime. The pimp would say, okay, go back on the street, start hustling again. This also goes back, of course, to pro-criminal attitudes. Now, have some people not accepted that what they've done is a crime? Um, and are they simply going to do it? Now, the last one, antisocial personality patterns, plays back to a little bit of what I talked about. At the extreme end of this, we have what's called asocial behavior, um, which has gone by different terms in the extreme. Uh, sociopathic, psychopathic behavior. Much of this has to do with a, a lack of empathy and a failure to emotionally mature and develop healthy patterns of behavior. Having said this, if you have someone at the extreme end of the scale, scale who is sociopathic, um, it's exceedingly difficult for them to break the pattern of behavior that has led to their incarceration. Um, almost, I would say, impossible. All right, parole is a little different. Parole has been abolished in the federal system. You don't see parole. Uh, you serve day for day in the federal system. Remember, the difference here is under parole, you serve your time in prison first, and then before your sentence is up, we let you out and we keep an eye on you. So parole is really based upon grace. It's mercy a contract of consent, you have to agree to this, and that you are in a degree of custody still. Um, you might seek parole, because everybody wants out of prison or jail early, I would assume, but um, it's often more stringent than probation, although conditions can be pretty frequent. Uh, probation is imposed by a judge, and this happens in open court. Typically, the offender serves no time. Parole is made after you're in prison. Now, Different states have adopted different mechanisms. Some states have parole boards. Others leave it up to special panels that are incarcerated. Sometimes uh, there's single individuals. There's just a, dozens of different ways to do this. But suffice it to say that it's, it's more secretive. Um, it's more done by individuals inside the system, which has go, both good and bad components to it. What is North Carolina? Well. Uh, North Carolina has the Structured Sentencing Act, and this came in in 1994. And the conditions for parole is, first of all, you must serve 85% of your sentence. So there is a committee appointed by the governor of the state, so currently Governor Cooper, who will appoint four members. Um, any interested party, when someone comes up for parole, can present evidence to the commission. And they will look at things like what crime was committed, what the previous record was, what your conduct in prison was, what your testimony was. And if they deem that, yes, um, you were good enough, uh, you can get parole. If not, you're going to stay in prison. Um, other jurisdictions, as I said, use slightly different ones. Um, there are parole boards, usually made up of three to seven members, uh, usually appointed by the governor for limited terms, but there can be, I believe there's some that are elected or appointed with some legislative input. The parole board decides who gets placed on parole. They determine conditions of parole. They determine revocation of parole very often, and they have a lot of power. Um, they also fly very much under the radar. I don't think anybody uh, tends to focus or think about them that much inside the system. Typical factors that are considered in parole, uh, what was your offense? If you've got someone who committed a violent, heinous act, a kidnapping, rape, murder, the idea that he's going to get parole is really stretching it. 
Um, what's your prior criminal record? So the more we see recidivistic behavior, uh, the more likely uh, we do not get parole. What's the attitude towards the victim and the victim's family? Has there been an atonement? Has there been a recognition that, yes, I did wrong? What is his or her physical, mental, and emotional health like? Um, what's the behavior in prison been? Have there been attempts to reform or improve? And this goes back to things like, okay, have you gotten, say, a GED? Have you undergone anger management or behavioral modification? And I think the last thing here, and this goes back to something we talked about in a previous chapter, what does the victim want? What does the victim want? What does the victim need? If you had someone that was the victim of domestic abuse and their spouse, husband, wife, common law husband, common law wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, was coming up for probation or parole, what do they want? Um, do they want to reintegrate him? Do they want to forgive him or her? Do they want to return them to the family or, or are they afraid? And if they come and they testify, that can have a huge impact um, in front of the parole board. Um, parole, of course, as I said, is an act of grace. It is not a right. Um, you can be denied parole because of behavior. Many, many states have started to move away from discretionary release, and they are looking at more mandatory re release. So sometimes they don't even say, we're going to go through a formal process. And this is really because of prison overcrowding, which we're going to, again, uh, look at some of the chapters coming up. Um, they'll look at guidelines, but they'll also look at, okay, how many people do we have in? Um, how worried do we have to be about this individual? Have they done how much of their time? And it can almost become a kind of rote behavior as opposed to discretionary. Conditions and revocations. Conditions of parole are very similar to probation. Uh, you're going to have to agree to a control contract which is you're going to accept things like, for example, and this can exist on probation, you got to let police officers and probation officers search whenever they want. You're going to have to agree things like, okay, if we're going to release you for a drug offense, you have to take drug tests. Um, revocation of parole typically happens because people commit crimes. It can be minor crimes uh, or it can be major ones. If it's just a technical violation, um, then really there's more discretion as to whether we're going to revoke the parole or not. Um, usually the parole revocations that I see, read about, have heard of, are really most often for crimes. And probably the most common one is possession of some drug. Okay, intermediate sanctions. Um, some people think, well, imprisonment and probation don't really reflect much of what we need, so we have to have something different. So here are some of the alternatives to either probation or incarceration. Fines, um, community service, restitution, forfeiture, and pretrial diversion. So exactly what it sounds like, um, you find someone. Now, this is very common. So you will have jurisdictions that uh, find people a lot. Community service, um, restitution. Again, you know, I think restitution is, is really important here. If your wallet gets stolen, if someone breaks in and um, burn down part of your house, or, you know, what you really want back is you want your wallet back or you want your house restored. So intermediate sanctions like make restitution to the victim can be very important. Unfortunately, uh, most people who commit crimes are poor, at least certain types of crime. Um, forfeiture, uh, this is very common in drugs. This is where, uh, let's suppose I stop someone on the highway and I find uh, 10 grams of cocaine in their glove compartment. Well, if they were driving a car, that car can be forfeited and can be seized. And then we have pretrial diversion programs. So pretrial diversion is an alternative where, and I've seen this most often with juveniles. So I had a juvenile uh, represented who had committed a burglary and he had broken in and he had taken some objects from another's house. 
So my big push was to try to keep him from getting a criminal record that would follow him the rest of his life. So we diverted him in North Carolina out of the regular criminal justice system. Very often, if you agree to this, you are going to get uh, specific counseling. Um, my client's family had to make restitution for the break-in. His parents were involved and they paid. Um, and you're trying to prevent someone from getting the label of criminal. Now, problem-solving courts are not used that much in North Carolina. They're more common in other jurisdictions, I would say. But they can be things like a, a drug addict. So you might have a special drug court where you get someone who has committed an offense and you say, okay, the core problem here is not that you broke into the piggly wiggly to steal uh, cigarettes. The core problem here is you did that to fund your addiction problem. Therefore, we want to get you in an addiction treatment program. Maybe it's an inpatient, maybe it's an outpatient program. So you're, you're trying to solve an underlying problem. And if you complete this very often, it's usually, again, used for juveniles or often, we can drop it. Sometimes we use it for people that are specialties like a veteran who suffers PTSD. Uh, forfeiture I talked about, but basically uh, this is something that has really taken off. Uh, billions of dollars in contraband and property have been seized, impounded, and sold, have been forfeited. It is a common mechanism now to extract money. We do have some other options uh, that we look at. We have day reporting centers, which are exactly what they sound like, uh, where you have someone that you have to report daily for treatment uh, and education. Sometimes you have to stay there. Uh, sometimes you have a halfway house where you have to return to it. Intensive probation supervision is the more restrictive alternative to regular probation. It's stricter. Um, it's more frequent surveillance and control. And the goal there is to give more control, more prison-like control over the individual under the belief that it's serious and we're more likely to be successful in handling them and treating them than if they are on non-intensive probation. Um, Shock incarceration. This, uh, one of the examples of this was a remarkably bad idea we tried called boot camp. Uh, being someone who went to boot camp, let me assure you that going through boot camp does not magically make you a better person. What it does do is it gives you a certain mindset. It makes you physically fit. Um, the idea of shock incarceration really started from a number of studies where we tried this. We, uh, I'll, I'll simplify it. Uh, this is not exactly accurate, but this is a picture of it. We asked for volunteers in the prison systems, and we got, say, 100 people to volunteer. And we looked over the candidates, and we took the top 50 that we thought would do okay, and we ran them through boot camp. And then out of that 50, 25 graduate. And then we let them go. Um, they went through military training, strict discipline, the whole nine yards, manual labor, physical training. We let these 25 people graduate. We go, and we find they don't commit crimes in the future. And people said, oh my God, we found the magic bullet. We started instituting this on a larger scale, and we had very low success rates. And people went back and they said, we messed up. Because the first thing we did is we didn't, we, we took only volunteers. So if you've got a thousand people in the criminal justice system and you ask for volunteers to undergo boot camp to get out early, only the most motivated people that want to change are going to volunteer in the first place. Then if you're going to review them, because remember we had a thousand people, we put 10%. All right, let's review that. We're only going to take a half of those. Now you're down to 5%. Now you've gotten rid of the people that are just doing it because they want to get out. Now you're doing it with people that you feel are sincere. Then you actually put them through it. And only, again, the most people they want to do it that really will push themselves get there. Trust me, that point that 2.5% at the end of that, they weren't going to commit crimes again in the future anyway. So shock incarceration is a nice theory. It goes kind of with this scared straight stuff we do too. The success rates are just not that high. Uh, we have home confinement. 
Um, this is requiring offenders to spend extended periods of time in their homes, often with electronic monitoring, which brings the next one, where we're watching people. And this is the famous, you know, anklets or bracelets. Home monitoring is, uh, can be a simple curfew. We can simply tell you you have to stay home. Uh, so, for example, I did a large number of drunk driving cases. And in a drunk driving case, uh, it's very common that they put restrictions on where you are and when you are. One of the restrictions they put is you can't drive at night, which is a type of curfew, unless you're going to or from a job. In fact, they don't want you driving at all usually unless you're going to or from a job or a school. Home detention, you're going to remain at home with some exemptions, uh, like school, counseling, treatment, jobs. Home incarceration, you're there all the time. You can't get out unless there's a medical uh, emergency. So, you know, the difference between detention and incarceration. And different monitoring systems exist here. Some of them are a phone monitoring where it, it rings and you have to answer when it's set time. Sometimes it's a, a, a anklet or a monitor you wear. There's all different types of technology there. All right, the last thing, and this was something I was going to talk about, net widening. Um, the, one of the criticisms of intermediate sanctions, community corrections, is that if you have the ability to do more cheaper, you might do it. You may say, well, why wouldn't you? Because um, if you say... Um, Probation, parole is really cheap, so we can make more things illegal. We can bring more people into the system. If I told you that probation and proba parole didn't exist, and that everybody you arrested had to go to prison, you might say, well, I only want the baddest of the bad to go to prison, because I've got a limited number of jail cells. I've got a limited number of prison cells. Therefore, I'm just going to put people in who committed acts of violence. I'm not going to put people in who are addicted to, to drugs. So net widening is the phenomenon when you have alternatives to incarceration, it means you can have more offenses. It increases the government's power to intervene in people's lives. And technology is even accelerating this. We're seeing more and more of this, the ability of the government to really monitor people. This is a serious issue to talk about as a civil libertarian. All right, on that note, we're right at about 52 minutes. Uh, we've done the 10th chapter. We're going to pick up uh, with chapter 11 coming up in our next meeting.